Part 3. Hercule Poirot sits back and thinks. 1. Which of them? M. Book and Dr. Constantine were talking together when Poirot entered the dining car. M. Book was looking depressed. Le voila, said the latter when he saw Poirot. Then he added as his friend sat down. If you solve this case, mon cher, I shall indeed believe in miracles. It worries you, this case? Naturally it worries me. I cannot make head or tail of it. I agree, said the doctor. He looked at Poirot with interest. To be frank, he said, I cannot see what you are going to do next. No, said Poirot thoughtfully. He took out his cigarette case and lit one of his tiny cigarettes. His eyes were dreamy. That, to me, is the interest of this case, he said. We are cut off from all the normal routes of procedure. Are these people whose evidence we have taken speaking the truth or lying? We have no means of finding out, except such means as we can devise ourselves. It is an exercise, this, of the brain. That is all very fine, said M. Book. But what have you to go upon? I told you just now. We have the evidence of the passengers and the evidence of our own eyes. Pretty evidence, that of the passengers. It told us just nothing at all. Poirot shook his head. I do not agree, my friend. The evidence of the passengers gave us several points of interest. Indeed, said M. Book skeptically. I did not observe it. That is because you did not listen. Well, tell me, what did I miss? I will just take one instance, the first evidence we heard, that of the young McQueen. He uttered, to my mind, one very significant phrase. About the letters? No, not about the letters. As far as I can remember, his words were, we traveled about. Mr. Ratchet wanted to see the world. He was hampered by knowing no languages. I acted more as a courier than a secretary. He looked from the doctor's face to that of M. Book. What? You still do not see? That is inexcusable, for you had a second chance again just now when he said, You're apt to be done down if you speak nothing but good American. You mean? M. Book still looked puzzled. Ah, uh, it is that you want it given to you in words of one syllable. Well, here it is. M. Ratchet spoke no French. Yet, when the conductor came in answer to his bell last night, it was a voice speaking in French that told him that it was a mistake and that he was not wanted. It was, moreover, a perfectly idiomatic phrase that was used, not one that a man knowing only a few words of French would have selected. Sene rain. Jamie sweet Trump. It is true, cried Constantine excitedly. We should have seen that. I remember your laying stress on the words when you repeated them to us. Now I understand your reluctance to rely upon the evidence of the dented watch. Already, at twenty-three minutes to one, Ratchet was dead. And it was his murderer speaking, finished him, book impressively. Poro raised a deprecating hand. Let us not go too fast. And do not let us assume more than we actually know. It is safe, I think, to say that at that time... Twenty-three minutes to one, some other person was in Ratchet's compartment, and that that person was either French, or could speak the French language fluently. You are very cautious, mon vieux. One should advance only a step at a time. We have no actual evidence that Ratchet was dead at that time. There is the cry that awakened you. Yes, that is true. In one way, said M. Book thoughtfully, this discovery does not affect things very much. You've heard someone moving about next door. That someone was not Ratchet, but the other man. Doubtless he is washing blood from his hands, clearing up after the crime, burning the incriminating letter. Then he waits till all is still, and when he thinks it is safe and the coast is clear he locks and chains Ratchet's door on the inside, unlocks the communicating door through into Mrs. Hubbard's compartment, and slips out that way. In fact it is exactly as we thought with the difference that Ratchet was killed about half an hour earlier, and the watch put on to a quarter past one to create an alibi. Not such a famous alibi, said Poirot. The hands of the watch pointed to 1.15, the exact time when the intruder actually left the scene of the crime. True, said M. Book, a little confused. 
What, then, does the watch convey to you? If the hands were altered, I say if, then the time at which they were set must have a significance. The natural reaction would be to suspect anyone who had a reliable alibi for the time indicated, in this case one fifteen. Yes, yes, said the doctor. That reasoning is good. We must also pay a little attention to the time the intruder entered the compartment. When had he an opportunity of doing so? Unless we are to assume the complicity of the real conductor, there was only one time when he could have done so, during the time the train stopped at Vinkovsai. After the train left Vinkovsai, the conductor was sitting facing the corridor, and whereas any one of the passengers would pay little attention to a wagon-lit attendant, the one person who would notice an imposter would be the real conductor. But during the halt at Vinkovsai, the conductor is out on the platform. The coast is clear. And, by our former reasoning, it must be one of the passengers, said M. Book. We come back to where we were. Which of them? Poro smiled. I have made a list, he said. If you like to see it, it will, perhaps, refresh your memory. The doctor and M. Book poured over the list together. It was written out neatly in a methodical manner in the order in which the passengers had been interviewed. Hector McQueen, American subject. Birth number six. Second class. Motive, possibly arising out of association with dead man. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., midnight to 1.30 vouched for by Colonel Arbuthnet, and 1.15 to 2 vouched for by conductor. Evidence against him, none. Suspicious circumstances, none. Conductor, Pierre Michel, French subject. Motive, none. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., seen by H.P. in corridor at same time as voice spoke from Ratchet's compartment at 12.37, from 1 a.m. to 1.16 vouched for by other two conductors. Evidence against him, none. Suspicious circumstances, the wagon-lit uniform found is a point in his favor since it seems to have been intended to throw suspicion on him. Edward Masterman, English subject. Birth number four. Second class. Motive, possibly arising out of connection with deceased, whose valet he was. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by Antonio Foscarelli. Evidence against him or suspicious circumstances, none, except that he is the only man the right height or size to have worn the wagon-lit uniform. On the other hand, it is unlikely that he speaks French well. Mrs. Hubbard, American subject. Birth number three. First class. Motive, none. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., none. Evidence against her or suspicious circumstances. Story of man in her compartment is substantiated by the evidence of Hardman and that of the woman Schmidt. Greta Olsen, Swedish subject. Birth number 10. Second class. Motive, none. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by Mary Debenham. No dot, was last to see Ratchet alive. Princess Dragomirov, naturalized French subject. Birth number 14. First class. Motive, was intimately acquainted with Armstrong family, and godmother to Sonia Armstrong. Alibi, from midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by conductor and maid. Evidence against her or suspicious circumstances, none. Count Andrenii, Hungarian subject. Diplomatic passport. Birth number 13. First class. Motive, none. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by conductor. This does not cover period from 1 to 115. Countess Andrenii, as above. Birth number 12. Motive, none. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m. took Trianal and slept. Vouched for by husband. Trianal bottle in her cupboard. Colonel Arbuthnet, British subject. Birth number 15. First class. Motive, none. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m. talked with McQueen till 1.30 went to own compartment, and did not leave it. Substantiated by McQueen and conductor. Evidence against him or suspicious circumstances. Pipe cleaner. Cyrus Hardman, American subject. Birth number 16. Second class. Motive, none known. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m. Did not leave compartment. Substantiated by McQueen and conductor. 
evidence against him or suspicious circumstances, none. Antonio Foscarelli, American subject. Italian birth. Birth number five. Second class. Motive, none known. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by Edward Masterman. Evidence against him or suspicious circumstances, none, except that weapon used might be said to suit his temperament. Videm, book. Mary Debenham, British subject. Birth number 11. Second class. Motive, none. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by Greta Olson. Evidence against her or suspension. Isha's circumstances, and her refusal to explain same. Hildegard Schmidt, German subject. Birth number 8. Second class. Motive, none. Alibi, midnight to 2 a.m., vouched for by conductor and her mistress. Went to bed. Was aroused by conductor at 12.38 approximate, and went to mistress. Note, the evidence of the passengers is supported by the statement of the conductor that no one entered or left Mr. Ratchet's compartment between the hours of midnight to one o'clock, when he himself went into the next coach, and from one fifteen to two o'clock. That document, you understand, said Poirot, is a mere précis of the evidence we heard, arranged that way for convenience. With a grimace M, Book handed it back. It is not illuminating, he said. Perhaps you may find this more to your taste, said Poirot with a slight smile as he handed him a second sheet of paper. Two. Ten questions. On the paper was written. Things needing explanation. The handkerchief marked with the initial H. Whose is it? The pipe cleaner. Was it dropped by Colonel Arbuthnet? Or by someone else? Who wore the scarlet kimono? Who was the man or woman masquerading in wagon-lit uniform? Why do the hands of the watch point to 1.15? Was the murder committed at that time? Was it earlier? Was it later? Can we be sure that Ratchet was stabbed by more than one person? What other explanation of his wounds can there be? Well, let us see what we can do, said M. Book, brightening a little at this challenge to his wits. The handkerchief to begin with. Let us by all means be orderly and methodical. Assuredly said Poirot, nodding his head in a satisfied fashion. M. Book continued somewhat didactically. The initial H is connected with three people, Mrs. Hubbard, Miss Debenham, whose second name is Hermione, and the maid Hildegard Schmidt. Ah, and of those three? It is difficult to say, but I think I should vote for Miss Debenham. For all one knows, she may be called by her second name and not her first. Also, there is already some suspicion attaching to her. That conversation you overheard, mon cher, was certainly a little curious, and so is her refusal to explain it. As for me, I plump for the American, said Dr. Constantine. It is a very expensive handkerchief that, and Americans, as all the world knows, do not care what they pay. So you both eliminate the maid? asked Poirot. Yes. As she herself said, it is the handkerchief of a member of the upper classes. And the second question, the pipe cleaner. Did Colonel Arbuthnet drop it, or somebody else? That is more difficult. The English, they do not stab. You are right there. I incline to the view that someone else dropped the pipe cleaner, and did so to incriminate the long-legged Englishman. As you said, M. Poirot. Put in the doctor. Two clues is too much carelessness. I agree with him. Book. The handkerchief was a genuine oversight, hence no one will admit that it is theirs. The pipe cleaner is a fake clue. In support of that theory, you notice that Colonel Arbuthnet shows no embarrassment and admits freely to smoking a pipe and using that type of cleaner. You reason well, said Poirot. Question number three. Who wore the scarlet kimono? Went on M. Book. As to that I will confess I have not the slightest idea. Have you any views on the subject, Dr. Constantine? None. Then we confess ourselves beaten there. The next question has, at any rate, possibilities. Who was the man or woman masquerading in wagon-lit uniform? Well, one can say with certainty a number of people whom it could not be. Hardman, Colonel Arbuthnet, Foscarelli, Count Andrani and Hector McQueen are all too tall. 
Mrs. Hubbard, Hildegard Schmidt and Greta Olsen are too broad. That leaves the valet, Miss Debenham, Princess Dragomirov and Countess Andrenii, and none of them sounds likely. Greta Olsen in one case and Antonio Foscarelli in the other both swear that Miss Debenham and the valet never left their compartments. Hildegard Schmidt swears to the princess being in hers, and Count Andrenii has told us that his wife took a sleeping draft. Therefore it seems impossible that it can be anybody, which is absurd. As our old friend Euclid says, murmured Poirot. It must be one of those four, said Dr. Constantine. Unless it is someone from outside who has found a hiding place, and that, we agreed, was impossible. M. Book had passed on to the next question on the list. Number 5. Why do the hands of the broken watch point to 115? I can see two explanations of that. Either it was done by the murderer to establish an alibi and afterwards he was prevented from leaving the compartment when he meant to do so by hearing people moving about, or else, wait, I have an idea coming. The other two waited respectfully while M. Book struggled in mental agony. I have it, he said at last. It was not the wagon-lit murderer who tampered with the watch. It was the person we have called the second murderer, the left-handed person. In other words, the woman in the scarlet kimono. She arrives later and moves back the hands of the watch in order to make an alibi for herself. Bravo, said Dr. Constantine. It is well imagined that. In fact, said Poirot, she stabbed him in the dark, not realizing that he was dead already, but somehow deduced that he had a watch in his pajama pocket, took it out, put back the hands blindly and gave it the requisite dent. M. Book looked at him coldly. Have you anything better to suggest yourself? He asked. At the moment, no, admitted Poirot. All the same, he went on. I do not think you have either of you appreciated the most interesting point about that watch. Does question number six deal with it? Asked the doctor. To that question, was the murder committed at that time, 115? I answer, no. I agree, said M. Book. Was it earlier? Is the next question. I say yes. You too, doctor? The doctor nodded. Yes, but the question was it later? Can also be answered in the affirmative. I agree with your theory, M. Book, and so I think does M. Poirot, although he does not wish to commit himself. The first murderer came earlier than 115. The second murderer came after 115. And as regards the question of left-handedness, ought we not to take steps to ascertain which of the passengers is left-handed? I have not completely neglected that point, said Poirot. You may have noticed that I made each passenger write either a signature or an address. That is not conclusive because some people do certain actions with the right hand and others with the left. Some write right-handed, but play golf left-handed. Still it is something. Every person questioned took the pen in their right hand with the exception of Princess Dragomirov, who refused to write. Princess Dragomirov, impossible, said M. Book. I doubt if she would have had the strength to inflict that particular left-handed blow, said Dr. Constantine dubiously. That particular wound had been inflicted with considerable force. More force than a woman could use? No, I would not say that. But I think more force than an elderly woman could display and Princess Dragomirov's physique is particularly frail. It might be a question of the influence of mind over body, said Poirot. Princess Dragomirov has great personality and immense will power. But let us pass from that for the moment. To questions numbers 9 and 10. Can we be sure that Ratchet was stabbed by more than one person, and what other explanation of the wounds can there be? In my opinion, medically speaking, there can be no other explanation of those wounds. To suggest that one man struck first feebly and then with violence, first with the right hand and then with the left, and after an interval of perhaps half an hour inflicted fresh wounds on a dead body, well, it does not make sense. No, said Poirot. It does not make sense. And you think that two murderers do make sense? As you yourself have said, what other explanation can there be? Poirot stared straight ahead of him. That is what I ask myself, he said. That is what I never cease to ask myself. He leaned back in his seat. From now on, it is all here, 
he tapped himself on the forehead. We have thrashed it all out. The facts are all in front of us, neatly arranged with order and method. The passengers have sat here, one by one, giving their evidence. We know all that can be known, from outside. He gave an affectionate smile at M. Book. It has been a little joke between us, has it not, this business of sitting back and thinking out the truth? Well, I am about to put my theory into practice, here before your eyes. You two must do the same. Let us all three close our eyes and think. One or more of those passengers killed Ratchet. Which of them? Three. Certain suggestive points. It was quite a quarter of an hour before anyone spoke. M. Book and Dr. Constantine had started by trying to obey Poirot's instructions. They had endeavored to see through the maze of conflicting particulars to a clear and outstanding solution. M. Book's thoughts had run something as follows. Assuredly, I must think. But as far as that goes, I have already thought. Poirot obviously thinks this English girl is mixed up in the matter. I cannot help feeling that that is most unlikely. The English are extremely cold. Probably it is because they have no figures, but that is not the point. It seems that the Italian could not have done it. A pity. I suppose the English valet is not lying when he said the other never left the compartment. But why should? He? It is not easy to bribe the English. They are so unapproachable. The whole thing is most unfortunate. I wonder when we shall get out of this. There must be some rescue work in progress. They are so slow in these countries, it is hours before anyone thinks of doing anything. And the police of these countries, they will be most trying to deal with, puffed up with importance, touchy on their dignity. They will make a grand affair of all this. It is not often that such a chance comes their way. It will be in all the newspapers. And from there on M, Book's thoughts went along a well-worn course which they had already traversed some hundred times. Dr. Constantine's thoughts ran thus. He is queer, this little man. A genius? Or a crank? Will he solve this mystery? Impossible. I can see no way out of it. It is all too confusing. Everyone is lying, perhaps. But even then that does not help one. If they are all lying it is just as confusing as if they were speaking the truth. Odd about those wounds. I cannot understand it. It would be easier to understand if he had been shot. After all, the term gunman must mean that they shoot with a gun. A curious country, America. I should like to go there. It is so progressive. When I get home I must get hold of Demetrius Zagoni. He has been to America. He has all the modern ideas. I wonder what Zia is doing at this moment. If my wife ever finds out. His thoughts went on to entirely private matters. Hercule Poirot sat very still. One might have thought he was asleep. And then, suddenly, after a quarter of an hour's complete immobility, his eyebrows began to move slowly up his forehead. A little sigh escaped him. He murmured beneath his breath. But, after all, why not? And if so, why, if so, that would explain everything. His eyes opened. They were green like a cat's. He said softly. Eh bien. I have thought. And you? Lost in their reflections, both men started violently. I have thought also, said M, book just a shade guilty. But I have arrived at no conclusion. The elucidation of crime is your métier, not mine, my friend. I, too, have reflected with great earnestness, said the doctor unblushingly, recalling his thoughts from certain pornographic details. I have thought of many possible theories but not one that really satisfies me. Poirot nodded amiably. His nod seemed to say, Quite right. That is the proper thing to say. You have given me the cue I expected. He sat very upright throughout his chest, caressed his mustache, and spoke in the manner of a practiced speaker addressing a public meeting. My friends, I have reviewed the facts in my mind, and have also gone over to myself the evidence of the passengers, with this result. I see, nebulously as yet, a certain explanation that would cover the facts as we know them. It is a very curious explanation, and I cannot be sure as yet that it is the true one. To find out definitely, I shall have to make certain experiments. 
I would like first to mention certain points which appear to me suggestive. Let us start with a remark made to me by M. Book in this very place on the occasion of our first lunch together on the train. He commented on the fact that we were surrounded by people of all classes, of all ages, of all nationalities. That is a fact somewhat rare at this time of year. The Athens Paris and the Bucharest Paris coaches, for instance, are almost empty. Remember also one passenger who failed to turn up. It is, I think, significant. Then there are some minor points that strike me as suggestive, for instance, the position of Mrs. Hubbard's sponge bag, the name of Mrs. Armstrong's mother, the detective methods of M. Hardman, the suggestion of M. McQueen that Ratchet himself destroyed the charred note we found, Princess Dragomirov's Christian name, and a grease spot on a Hungarian passport. The two men stared at him. Do they suggest anything to you, those points? Asked Poirot. Not a thing. Said M. Book frankly. And M. Le Doctor? I do not understand in the least of what you are talking. M. Book, meanwhile, seizing upon the one tangible thing his friend had mentioned, was sorting through the passports. With a grunt he picked up that of Count and Countess Andrenii and opened it. Is this what you mean? This dirty mark? Yes. It is a fairly fresh grease spot. You notice where it occurs. At the beginning of the description of the Count's wife, her Christian name, to be exact. But I confess that I still do not see the point. I am going to approach it from another angle. Let us go back to the handkerchief found at the scene of the crime. As we have stated not long ago, three people are associated with the letter H. Mrs. Hubbard, Miss Debenham, and the maid, Hildegard Schmidt. Now let us regard that handkerchief from another point of view. It is, my friends, an extremely expensive handkerchief, an objet de luxe, handmade, embroidered in Paris. Which of the passengers, apart from the initial, was likely to own such a handkerchief? Not Mrs. Hubbard, a worthy woman with no pretensions to reckless extravagance in dress. Not Miss Debenham, that class of English woman has a dainty linen handkerchief, but not an expensive wisp of cambric costing perhaps two hundred francs. And certainly not the maid. But there are two women on the train who would be likely to own such a handkerchief. Let us see if we can connect them in any way with the letter H. The two women I refer to are Princess Dragomirov, whose Christian name is Natalia, put in M, book ironically. Exactly. And her Christian name, as I said just now, is decidedly suggestive. The other woman is Countess Andrenii. And at once something strikes us. You. Me, then. Her Christian name on her passport is disfigured by a blob of grease. Just an accident, anyone would say. But consider that Christian name. Elena. Suppose that, instead of Elena, it were Helena. That capital H could be turned into a capital E and then run over the small E next to it quite easily. And then a spot of grease dropped to cover up the alteration. Helena cried M. Book. It is an idea, that. Certainly it is an idea. I look about for any confirmation, however slight, of my idea, and I find it. One of the luggage labels on the Countess's baggage is slightly damp. It is one that happens to run over the first initial on top of the case. That label has been soaked off and put on again in a different place. You begin to convince me, said M. Book. But the Countess Andrenii, Surely. Ah, uh, now, mon view, you must turn yourself round and approach an entirely different angle of the case. How was this murder intended to appear to everybody? Do not forget that the snow has upset all the murderer's original plan. Let us imagine, for a little minute, that there is no snow, that the train proceeded on its normal course. What, then, would have happened? The murder, let us say would still have been discovered in all probability at the Italian frontier early this morning. Much of the same evidence would have been given to the Italian police. The threatening letters would have been produced by M. McQueen M. Hardman would have told his story, Mrs. Hubbard would have been eager to tell how a man passed through her compartment, the button would have been found. I imagine that two things only would have been different. The man would have passed through Mrs. Hubbard's compartment just before one o'clock and the wagon-lit uniform would have been found cast off in one of the toilets. You mean? 
I mean that the murder was planned to look like an outside job. The assassin would have been presumed to have left the train at Broad, where the train is timed to arrive at 058. Somebody would probably have passed a strange wagon-lit conductor in the corridor. The uniform would be left in a conspicuous place so as to show clearly just how the trick had been played. No suspicion would have been attached to the passengers. That, my friends, was how the affair was intended to appear to the outside world. But the axe sigh. Dent to the train changes everything. Doubtless we have here the reason why the man remained in the compartment with his victim so long. He was waiting for the train to go on. But at last he realized that the train was not going on. Different plans would have to be made. The murderer would now be known to be still on the train. Yes, yes, said M. Book impatiently. I see all that. But where does the handkerchief come in? I am returning to it by a somewhat circuitous route. To begin with, you must realize that the threatening letters were in the nature of a blind. They might have been lifted bodily out of an indifferently written American crime novel. They are not real. They are, in fact, simply intended for the police. What we have to ask ourselves is, did they deceive Ratchet? On the face of it, the answer seems to be, no. His instructions to Hardman seemed to point to a definite private enemy of the identity of whom he was well aware. That is if we accept Hardman's story as true. But Ratchet certainly received one letter of a very different character, the one containing a reference to the Armstrong baby, a fragment of which we found in his compartment. In case Ratchet had not realized it sooner, this was to make sure that he understood the reason of the threats against his life. That letter, as I have said all along, was not intended to be found. The murderer's first care was to destroy it. This, then, was the second hitch in his plans. The first was the snow, the second was our reconstruction of that fragment. That note being destroyed so carefully can only mean one thing. There must be on the train someone so intimately connected with the Armstrong family that the finding of that note would immediately direct suspicion upon that person. Now we come to the other two clues that we found. I pass over the pipe cleaner. We have already said a good deal about that. Let us pass on to the handkerchief. Taken at its simplest, it is a clue which directly incriminates someone whose initial is H, and it was dropped there unwittingly by that person. Exactly, said Dr. Constantine. She finds out that she has dropped the handkerchief and immediately takes steps to conceal her Christian name. How fast you go. You arrive at a conclusion much sooner than I would permit myself to do. Is there any other alternative? Certainly there is. Suppose, for instance, that you have committed a crime and wish to cast suspicion for it on someone else. Well, there is on the train a certain person connected intimately with the Armstrong family, a woman. Suppose, then, that you leave there a handkerchief belonging to that woman. She will be questioned. Her connection with the Armstrong family will be brought out. Et voila. Motive, and an incriminating article of evidence. But in such a case, objected the doctor, the person indicated being innocent would not take steps to conceal her identity. Ah, really? That is what you think. That is truly the opinion of the police court. But I know human nature, my friend, and I tell you that, suddenly confronted with the possibility of being tried for murder, the most innocent person will lose their head and do the most absurd things. No, no, the grease spot and the changed label do not prove guilt. They only prove that the Countess Andrenii is anxious for some reason to conceal her identity. What do you think her connection with the Armstrong family can be? She has never been in America, she says. Exactly, and she speaks broken English, and she has a very foreign appearance which she exaggerates but it should not be difficult to guess who she is. I mentioned just now the name of Mrs. Armstrong's mother. It was Linda Arden, and she was a very celebrated actress, among other things a Shakespearean actress. Think of as you like it, the forest of Arden and Rosalind. It was there she got the inspiration for her acting name. Linda Arden, the name by which she was known all over the world, was not her real name. It may have been Goldenberg, she quite likely had Central European blood in her veins, a strain of Jewish, perhaps. Many nationalities drift to America. I suggest to you, gentlemen, that that young sister of Mrs. Armstrong's, 
little more than a child at the time of the tragedy, was Helena Goldenberg the younger daughter of Linda Arden, and that she married Count Andrenii when he was an attaché in Washington. But Princess Dragomirov says that she married an Englishman, whose name she cannot remember. I ask you, my friends, is that really likely? Princess Dragomirov loved Linda Arden as great ladies do love great artists. She was godmother to one of her daughters. Would she forget so quickly the married name of the other daughter? It is not likely. No, I think we can safely say that Princess Dragomirov was lying. She knew Helena was on the train, she had seen her. She realized at once, as soon as she heard who Ratchet really was, that Helena would be suspected. And so, when we question her as to the sister she promptly lies, is vague, cannot remember, but thinks Helena married an Englishman, a suggestion as far away from the truth as possible. One of the restaurant attendants came through the door at the end and approached them. He addressed them, Book. The dinner, monsieur, shall I serve it? It is ready some little time. M. Book looked at Poro. The latter nodded. By all means, let dinner be served. The attendant vanished through the doors at the other end. His bell could be heard ringing and his voice upraised. Premier service. Le diner est servi. Premier diner, first service. Four. The grease spot on a Hungarian passport. Poirot shared a table with them, Book and the doctor. The company assembled in the restaurant car was a very subdued one. They spoke little. Even the loquacious Mrs. Hubbard was unnaturally quiet. She murmured as she sat. I don't feel as though I've got the heart to eat anything. And then partook of everything offered her, encouraged by the Swedish lady, who seemed to regard her as a special charge. Before the meal was served Poirot had caught the chief attendant by the sleeve and murmured something to him. Constantine had a pretty good guess what the instructions had been, as he noticed that the Count and Countess Andrenii were always served last and that at the end of the meal there was a delay in making out their bill. It therefore came about that the Count and Countess were the last left in the restaurant car. When they rose at length and moved in the direction of the door, Poirot sprang up and followed them. Pardon, madam, you have dropped your handkerchief. He was holding out to her the tiny monogrammed square. She took it, glanced at it, then handed it back to him. You are mistaken, monsieur, that is not my handkerchief. Not your handkerchief? Are you sure? Perfectly sure, monsieur. And yet, madam, it has your initial, the initial H. The count made a sudden movement. Poirot ignored him. His eyes were fixed on the countess's face. Looking steadily at him, she replied, I do not understand, monsieur. My initials are yea. I think not. Your name is Helena, not Elena. Helena Goldenberg, the younger daughter of Linda Arden. Helena Goldenberg, the sister of Mrs. Armstrong. There was a dead silence for a minute or two. Both the count and countess had gone deadly white. Poro said in a gentler tone, it is of no use denying. That is the truth, is it not? The Count burst out furiously. I demand, monsieur, by what right you— She interrupted him, putting up a small hand towards his mouth. No, Rudolph. Let me speak. It is useless to deny what this gentleman says. We had better sit down and talk the matter out. Her voice had changed. It still had the southern richness of tone but it had become suddenly more clear-cut and incisive. It was, for the first time, a definitely American voice. The Count was silenced. He obeyed the gesture of her hand they both sat down opposite Poirot. Your statement, monsieur, is quite true, said the Countess. I am Helena Goldenberg, the younger sister of Mrs. Armstrong. You did not acquaint me with that fact this morning, Madame la Comtesse. No. In fact, all that your husband and you told me was a tissue of lies. Monsieur, cried the Count angrily. Do not be angry, Rudolph. M. 
Poirot puts the fact rather brutally, but what he says is undeniable. I am glad you admit the facts so freely, madam. Will you now tell me your reasons for so doing and also for altering your Christian name on your passport? That was my doing entirely. Put in the count. Helena said quietly. Surely, M. Poirot, you can guess my reason, our reason. This man who was killed is the man who murdered my baby niece, who killed my sister, who broke my brother-in-law's heart. Three of the people I loved best and who made up my home, my world. Her voice rang out passionately. She was a true daughter of that mother, the emotional force of whose acting had moved huge audiences to tears. She went on more quietly. Of all the people on the train, I alone had probably the best motive for killing him. And you did not kill him, madam? I swear to you, M. Poirot, and my husband knows and will swear also, that, much as I may have been tempted to do so, I never lifted a hand against that man. I too, gentlemen, said the Count. I give you my word of honor that last night Helena never left her compartment. She took a sleeping draft exactly as I said. She is utterly and entirely innocent. Poirot looked from one to the other of them. On my word of honor, repeated the Count. Poirot shook his head slightly. And yet you took it upon yourself to alter the name in the passport? Monsieur Poirot, the Count spoke earnestly and passionately. Consider my position. Do you think I could stand the thought of my wife dragged through a sordid police case? She was innocent, I knew it, but what she said was true. Because of her connection with the Armstrong family she would have been immediately suspected. She would have been questioned, arrested perhaps. Since some evil chance had taken us on the same train as this man Ratchet, there was, I felt sure, but one thing for it. I admit, monsieur, that I lied to you, all, that is, save in one thing. My wife never left her compartment last night. He spoke with an earnestness that it was hard to gainsay. I do not say that I disbelieve you, monsieur, said Poirot slowly. Your family is, I know, a proud and ancient one. It would be bitter indeed for you to have your wife dragged into an unpleasant police case. With that I can sympathize. But how, then, do you explain the presence of your wife's handkerchief actually in the dead man's compartment? That handkerchief is not mine, monsieur, said the countess. In spite of the initial H? In spite of the initial. I have handkerchiefs not unlike that, but not one that is exactly of that pattern. I know, of course, that I cannot hope to make you believe me, but I assure you that it is so. That handkerchief is not mine. It may have been placed there by someone in order to incriminate you. She smiled a little. You are enticing me to admit that, after all, it is mine? But indeed, M. Poirot, it isn't. She spoke with great earnestness. Then why, if the handkerchief was not yours, did you alter the name in the passport? The Count answered this. Because we heard that a handkerchief had been found with the initial H on it. We talked the matter over together before we came to be interviewed. I pointed out to Helena that if it were seen that her Christian name began with an H, she would immediately be subjected to much more rigorous questioning. And the thing was so simple. To alter Helena to Elena was easily done. You have, M. Leconte, the makings of a very fine criminal, remarked Poirot dryly. A great natural ingenuity and an apparently remorseless determination to mislead justice. Oh, no, no, the girl leaned forward. M. Poirot, he's explained to you how it was. She broke from French into English. I was scared, absolutely dead scared, you understand. It had been so awful, that time, and to have it all raked up again. And to be suspected and perhaps thrown into prison. I was just scared stiff, M. Poirot. Can't you understand at all? Her voice was lovely, deep, rich, pleading, the voice of the daughter of Linda Arden the actress. Poirot looked gravely at her. If I am to believe you, madam, and I do not say that I will not believe you, then you must help me. Help you? Yes. The reason for the murder lies in the past, in that tragedy which broke up your home and saddened your young life. Take me back into the past, mademoiselle that I may find there the link that explains the whole thing. What can there be to tell you? They are all dead, she repeated mournfully. 
All dead, all dead, Robert, Sonia, darling, darling Daisy. She was so sweet, so happy, she had such lovely curls. We were all just crazy about her. There was another victim, madam. An indirect victim, you might say. Per Suzanne? Yes, I had forgotten about her. The police questioned her. They were convinced she had something to do with it. Perhaps she had, but if so, only innocently. She had, I believe, chatted idly with someone, giving information as to the time of Daisy's outings. The poor thing got terribly wrought up. She thought she was being held responsible. She shuddered. She threw herself out of the window. Oh, it was horrible. She buried her face in her hands. What nationality was she, madam? She was French. What was her last name? It's absurd, but I can't remember. We all called her Suzanne. A pretty laughing girl. She was devoted to Daisy. She was the nursery maid, was she not? Yes. Who was the nurse? She was a trained hospital nurse. Stenga Berg her name was. She, too, was devoted to Daisy and to my sister. Now, madam, I want you to think carefully before you answer this question. Have you, since you were on this train, seen anyone that you recognized? She stared at him. I? No, no one at all. What about Princess Dragomirov? Oh, her? I know her, of course. I thought you meant anyone, anyone from, from that time. So I did, madam. Now think carefully. Some years have passed, remember. The person might have altered their appearance. Helena pondered deeply. Then she said, No, I am sure, there is no one. You yourself, you were a young girl at the time, did you have no one to superintend your studies or to look after you? Oh, yes, I had a dragon, a sort of governess to me and secretary to Sonia combined. She was English or rather Scotch, a big, red-haired woman. What was her name? Miss Freebody. Young or old? She seemed frightfully old to me. I suppose she couldn't have been more than forty. Suzanne, of course, used to look after my clothes and made me. And there were no other inmates of the house. Only servants. And you are certain, quite certain, madam, that you have recognized no one on the train? She replied earnestly. No one, monsieur. No one at all. 5. The Christian Name of Princess Dragomirov When the Count and Countess had departed, Poirot looked across at the other two. You see, he said, we make progress. Excellent work, said M. Book cordially. For my part, I should never have dreamed of suspecting Count and Countess Andrenii. I will admit I thought them quite hors de combat. I suppose there is no doubt that she committed the crime? It is rather sad. Still, they will not guillotine her. There are extenuating circumstances. A few years' imprisonment, that will be all. In fact, you are quite certain of her guilt. My dear friend, surely there is no doubt of it? I thought your reassuring manner was only to smooth things over till we are dug out of the snow and the police take charge. You do not believe the Count's positive assertion, on his word of honor, that his wife is innocent? Mon cher, naturally, what else could he say? He adores his wife. He wants to save her. He tells his lie very well, quite in the grand senior manner. But what else than a lie could it be? Well, you know, I had the preposterous idea that it might be the truth. No, no. The handkerchief, remember. The handkerchief clinches the matter. Oh, I am not so sure about the handkerchief. You remember, I always told you that there were two possibilities as to the ownership of the handkerchief. All the same. M. Book broke off. The door at the end had opened, and Princess Dragomirov entered the dining car. She came straight to them and all three men rose to their feet. She spoke to Poirot, ignoring the others. I believe, monsieur, she said, that you have a handkerchief of mine. Poirot shot a glance of triumph at the other two. Is this it, madam? He produced the little square of fine cambric. That is it. It has my initial in the corner. But Madame La Princesse T. Hat is the letter H, said M. Book. Your Christian name, pardon me, is Natalia. 
she gave him a cold stare. That is correct, monsieur. My handkerchiefs are always annulled in the Russian characters. H is N in Russian. M. Book was somewhat taken aback. There was something about this indomitable old lady which made him feel flustered and uncomfortable. You did not tell us that this handkerchief was yours at the inquiry this morning. You did not ask me, said the princess dryly. Pray be seated, madam, said Poirot. She sighed. I may as well, I suppose. She sat down. You need not make a long business of this, Messrs. Your next question will be, how did my handkerchief come to be lying by a murdered man's body? My reply to that is that I have no idea. You have really no idea. None whatever. You will excuse me, madam, but how much can we rely upon the truthfulness of your replies? Poirot said the words very softly. Princess Dragomirov answered contemptuously. I suppose you mean because I did not tell you that Helena Andrenia was Mrs. Armstrong's sister? In fact, you deliberately lied to us in the matter. Certainly. I would do the same again. Her mother was my friend. I believe, Messrs, in loyalty, to one's friends and one's family and one's caste. You do not believe in doing your utmost to further the ends of justice? In this case I consider that justice, strict justice, has been done. Poirot leaned forward. You see my difficulty, madam. In this matter of the handkerchief, even, am I to believe you? Or are you shielding your friend's daughter? Oh, I see what you mean. Her face broke into a grim smile. Well, Messrs, this statement of mine can be easily proved. I will give you the address of the people in Paris who make my handkerchiefs. You have only to show them the one in question, and they will inform you that it was made to my order over a year ago. The handkerchief is mine, Messrs. She rose. Have you anything further you wish to ask me? Your maid, madam, did she recognize this handkerchief when we showed it to her this morning? She must have done so. She saw it and said nothing? Ah, well, that shows that she too can be loyal. With a slight inclination of her head she passed out of the dining car. So that was it, murmured Poirot softly. I noticed just a trifling hesitation when I asked the maid if she knew to whom the handkerchief belonged. She was uncertain whether or not to admit that it was her mistress's. But how does that fit in with that strange central idea of mine? Yes, it might well be. Ah, said M. Book with a characteristic gesture. She is a terrible old lady, that? Could she have murdered Ratchet? Asked Poirot of the doctor. He shook his head. Those blows, the ones delivered with great force penetrating the muscle, never, never could anyone with so frail a physique inflict them. But the feebler ones? The feebler ones, yes. I am thinking, said Poirot, of the incident this morning when I said to her that the strength was in her will rather than in her arm. It was in the nature of a trap, that remark. I wanted to see if she would look down at her right or her left arm. She did neither. She looked at them both. But she made a strange reply. She said, no, I have no strength in these. I do not know whether to be sorry or glad. A curious remark that. It confirms me in my belief about the crime. It did not settle the point about the left-handedness. No. By the way, did you notice that Count Andrenii keeps his handkerchief in his right-hand breast pocket? M. Book shook his head. His mind reverted to the astonishing revelations of the last half hour. He murmured, Lies, and again lies, it amazes me, the amount of lies we had told to us this morning. There are more still to discover, said Poirot cheerfully. You think so? I shall be very disappointed if it is not so. Such duplicity is terrible, said M. Book. But it seems to please you, he added reproachfully. It has this advantage, said Poirot. If you confront anyone who has lied with the truth, they usually admit it, often out of sheer surprise. It is only necessary to guess right to produce your effect. That is the only way to conduct this case. I select each passenger in turn, consider their evidence, and say to myself, if so and so is lying, on what point are they lying and what is the reason for the lie? And I answer if they are lying, if, you mark, it could only be for such a reason and on such a point. 
We have done that once very successfully with Countess Andrenii. We shall now proceed to try the same method on several other persons. And supposing, my friend, that your guess happens to be wrong? Then one person, at any rate, will be completely freed from suspicion. Ah, a process of elimination. Exactly. And who do we tackle next? We are going to tackle that Pukka Sahib, Colonel Arbuthnet. 6. A second interview with Colonel Arbuthnet. Colonel Arbuthnet was clearly annoyed at being summoned to the dining car for a second interview. His face wore a most forbidding expression as he sat down and said, Well, all my apologies for troubling you a second time, said Poirot, but there is still some information that I think you might be able to give us. Indeed? I hardly think so. To begin with, you see this pipe cleaner? Yes. Is it one of yours? Don't know. I don't put a private mark on them, you know. Are you aware, Colonel Arbuthnet, that you are the only man amongst the passengers in the Stambul Calais carriage who smokes a pipe? In that case it probably is one of mine. Do you know where it was found? Not the least idea. It was found by the body of the murdered man. Colonel Arbuthnet raised his eyebrows. Can you tell us, Colonel Arbuthnet, how it is likely to have got there? If you mean did I drop it there myself, no, I didn't. Did you go into Mr. Ratchet's compartment at any time? I never even spoke to the man. You never spoke to him and you did not murder him? The colonel's eyebrows went up again sardonically. If I had, I should hardly be likely to acquaint you with the fact. As a matter of fact, I didn't murder the fellow. Ah, well, murmured Poirot. It is of no consequence. I beg your pardon? I said that it was of no consequence. Oh, Arbuthnet looked taken aback. He eyed Poirot uneasily. Because you see, continued the little man, the pipe cleaner, it is of no importance. I can myself think of eleven other excellent explanations of its presence. Arbuthnet stared at him. What I really wished to see you about was quite another matter, went on Poirot. Miss Debenham may have told you, perhaps, that I overheard some words spoken to you at the station of Konya? Arbuthnet did not reply. She said, not now. When it's all over. When it's behind us. Do you know to what those words referred? I am sorry, M. Poirot, but I must refuse to answer that question. Porquoi? The colonel said stiffly. I suggest that you should ask Miss Debenham herself for the meaning of those words. I have done so. And she refused to tell you? Yes. Then I should think it would have been perfectly plain, even to you, that my lips are sealed. You will not give away a lady's secret? You can put it that way, if you like. Miss Debenham told me that they referred to a private matter of her own. Then why not accept her word for it? Because, Colonel Arbuthnet, Miss Debenham is what one might call a highly suspicious character. Nonsense said the colonel with warmth. It is not nonsense. You have nothing whatever against her. Not the fact that Miss Debenham was companion governess in the Armstrong household at the time of the kidnapping of little Daisy Armstrong? There was a minute's dead silence. Poirot nodded his head gently. You see, he said, we know more than you think. If Miss Debenham is innocent, why did she conceal that fact? Why did she tell me that she had never been in America? The colonel cleared his throat. Aren't you possibly making a mistake? I am making no mistake. Why did Miss Debenham lie to me? Colonel Arbuthnet shrugged his shoulders. You had better ask her. I still think that you are wrong. Poirot raised his voice and called. One of the restaurant attendants came from the far end of the car. Go and ask the English lady in number eleven if she will be good enough to come here. Bien, monsieur. The man departed. The four men sat in silence. Colonel Arbuthnet's face looked as though it were carved out of wood. It was rigid and impassive. The man returned. Thank you. A minute or two later Mary Debenham entered the dining car. 7. The Identity of Mary Debenham She wore no hat. Her head was thrown back as though in defiance. The sweep of her hair back from her face, the curve of her nostril suggested the figurehead of a ship plunging gallantly into a rough sea. In that moment she was beautiful. 
Her eyes went to Arbuthnet for a minute, just a minute. She said to Poirot, You wish to see me? I wish to ask you, mademoiselle, why you lied to us this morning. Lied to you? I don't know what you mean. You concealed the fact that at the time of the Armstrong tragedy you were actually living in the house. You told me that you had never been in America. He saw her flinch for a moment, and then recover herself. Yes, she said. That is true. No, mademoiselle, it was false. You misunderstood me. I mean that it is true that I lied to you. Ah, uh, you admit it? Her lips curved into a smile. Certainly. Since you have found me out. You are at least frank, mademoiselle. There does not seem anything else for me to be. Well, of course, that is true. And now, mademoiselle, may I ask you the reason for these evasions? I should have thought the reason leapt to the I am. Poirot? It does not leap to mine, mademoiselle. She said in a quiet, even voice with a trace of hardness in it. I have my living to get. You mean? She raised her eyes and looked him full in the face. How much do you know, M. Poirot, of the fight to get and keep decent employment? Do you think that a girl who had been detained in connection with a murder case, whose name and perhaps photographs were reproduced in the English papers, do you think that any nice, ordinary, middle-class Englishwoman would want to engage that girl as governess to her daughters? I do not see why not, if no blame attached to you. Oh, blame, it is not blame, it is publicity. So far, M. Poro, I have succeeded in life. I have had well-paid, pleasant posts. I was not going to risk the position I had attained when no good end could have been served. I will venture to suggest, mademoiselle, that I would have been the best judge of that, not you. She shrugged her shoulders. For instance, you could have helped me in the matter of identification. What do you mean? Is it possible, mademoiselle, that you did not recognize in the Countess Andrenii Mrs. Armstrong's young sister whom you taught in New York? Countess Andrenii? No. She shook her head. It may seem extraordinary to you, but I did not recognize her. She was not grown up, you see, when I knew her. That was over three years ago. It is true that the Countess reminded me of someone. It puzzled me. But she looks so foreign. I never connected her with the little American schoolgirl. It is true that I only glanced at her casually when coming into the restaurant car. I noticed her clothes more than her face. She smiled faintly. Women do. And then, well, I had my own preoccupations. You will not tell me your secret, mademoiselle? Poirot's voice was very gentle and persuasive. She said in a low voice. I can't, I can't. And suddenly, without warning, she broke down, dropping her face down upon her outstretched arms and crying as though her heart would break. The colonel sprang up and stood awkwardly beside her. I look here. He stopped and, turning round, scowled fiercely at Poirot. I'll break every bone in your damned body, you dirty little whippersnapper, he said. Monsieur, protested M. Book. Arbuthnet had turned back to the girl. Mary, for God's sake. She sprang up. It's nothing. I'm all right. You don't need me any more, do you, M. Poirot? If you do, you must come and find me. Oh, what an idiot! What an idiot I'm making of myself. She hurried out of the car. Arbuthnet, before following her, turned once more on Poirot. Miss Debenham's got nothing to do with this business. Nothing, do you hear? And if she's worried and interfered with, you'll have me to deal with. He strode out. I like to see an angry Englishman, said Poirot. They are very amusing. The more emotional they feel, the less command they have of language. But M. Book was not interested in the emotional reactions of Englishmen. He was overcome by admiration of his friend. Mon cher vous êtes he cried. Another miraculous guess. Say formidable. It is incredible how you think of these things, said Dr. Constantine admiringly. Oh, I claim no credit this time. It was not a guess. Countess Andreni, I practically told me. Comment? Surely not. You remember I asked her about her governess or companion? I had already decided in my mind that if Mary Debenham were mixed up in the matter, she must have figured in the household in some such capacity. 
Yes, but the Countess Andrani I described a totally different person. Exactly. A tall, middle-aged woman with red hair. In fact, the exact opposite in every respect of Miss Debenham, so much so as to be quite remarkable. But then she had to invent a name quickly, and there it was that the unconscious association of ideas gave her away. She said Miss Freebody, you remember? Yes? Eh bien, you may not know it, but there is a shop in London that was called, until recently, Debenham and Freebody. With the name Debenham running in her head, the Countess clutches at another name quickly, and the first that comes is Freebody. Naturally, I understood immediately. That is yet another lie. Why did she do it? Possibly more loyalty. It makes things a little difficult. My FOI, said M, book with violence. But does everybody on this train tell lies? That, said Poirot, is what we are about to find out. 8. Further surprising revelations. Nothing would surprise me now, said M, book. Nothing. Even if everybody in the train proved to have been in the Armstrong household, I should not express surprise. That is a very profound remark, said Poirot. Would you like to see what your favorite suspect, the Italian, has to say for himself? You are going to make another of these famous guesses of yours? Precisely. It is really a most extraordinary case, said Constantine. No, it is most natural. M. Book flung up his arms in comic despair. If this is what you call natural, ma mommy. Words failed him. Poirot had by this time requested the dining car attendant to fetch Antonio Foscarelli. The big Italian had a wary look in his eye as he came in. He shot nervous glances from side to side like a trapped animal. What do you want? he said. I have nothing to tell you, nothing, do you hear? Perdio. He struck his hand on the table. Yes, you have something more to tell us, said Poirot firmly. The truth. The truth? He shot an uneasy glance at Poirot. All the assurance and geniality had gone out of his manner. Maze we. It may be that I know it already. But it will be a point in your favor if it comes from you spontaneously. You talk like the American police. Come clean, that is what they say. Come clean. Ah, uh, so you have had experience of the New York police? No, no, never. They could not prove a thing against me, but it was not for want of trying, Poirot said quietly. That was in the Armstrong case, was it not? You were the chauffeur? His eyes met those of the Italian. The bluster went out of the big man. He was like a prick balloon. Since you know, why asked me? Why did you lie this morning? Business reasons. Besides, I do not trust the Yugoslav police. They hate the Italians. They would not have given me justice. Perhaps it is exactly justice that they would have given you. No, no, I had nothing to do with this business last night. I never left my carriage. The long-faced Englishman, he can tell you so. It was not I who killed this pig, this ratchet. You cannot prove anything against me. Poro was writing something on a sheet of paper. He looked up and said quietly, Very good. You can go. Foscarelli lingered uneasily. You realize that it was not I, that I could have had nothing to do with it. I said that you could go. It is a conspiracy. You are going to frame me? All for a pig of a man who should have gone to the chair. It was an infamy that he did not. If it had been me, if I had been arrested. But it was not you. You had nothing to do with the kidnapping of the child. What is that you are saying? Why, that little one, she was the delight of the house. Tonio, she called me. And she would sit in the car and pretend to hold the wheel. All the household worshipped her. Even the police came to understand that. Ah, the beautiful little one. His voice had softened. The tears came into his eyes. Then he wheeled round abruptly on his heel and strode out of the dining car. Pietro, called Poirot. The dining car attendant came at a run. The number ten, the Swedish lady. Bien, monsieur. Another? cried M. Book. Ah, no, it is not possible. I tell you it is not possible. Mon cher, we have to know. 
Even if in the end everybody on the train proves to have a motive for killing Ratchet, we have to know. Once we know, we can settle once for all where the guilt lies. My head is spinning. Groan M. Book. Greta Olsen was ushered in sympathetically by the attendant. She was weeping bitterly. She collapsed on the seat facing Poirot and wept steadily into a large handkerchief. Now do not distress yourself, mademoiselle. Do not distress yourself. Poirot patted her on the shoulder. Just a few little words of truth, that is all. You were the nurse who was in charge of little Daisy Armstrong? It is true, it is true. What the wretched woman. Ah, she was an angel, a little sweet, trustful angel. She knew nothing but kindness and love, and she was taken away by that wicked man, cruelly treated, and her poor mother, and the other little one who never lived at all. You cannot understand, you cannot know, if you had been there as I was, if you had seen the whole terrible tragedy, I ought to have told you the truth about myself this morning. But I was afraid, afraid. I did so rejoice that that evil man was dead, that he could not any more kill or torture little children. Ah, uh, I cannot speak, I have no words. She wept with more vehemence than ever. Poirot continued to pat her gently on the shoulder. There, there, I comprehend, I comprehend everything, everything I tell you. I will ask you no more questions. It is enough that you have admitted what I know to be the truth. I understand, I tell you. By now inarticulate with sobs, Greta Olsen rose and groped her way blindly towards the door. As she reached it she collided with a man coming in. It was the valet, Masterman. He came straight up to Poirot and spoke in his usual, quiet, unemotional voice. I hope I'm not intruding, sir. I thought it best to come along at once, sir, and tell you the truth. I was Colonel Armstrong's Batman in the war, sir, and afterwards I was his valet in New York. I'm afraid I concealed that fact this morning. It was very wrong of me, sir and I thought I'd better come and make a clean breast of it. But I hope, sir, that you're not suspecting Tonio in any way. Old Tonio, sir, wouldn't hurt a fly. And I can swear positively that he never left the carriage all last night. So, you see, sir, he couldn't have done it. Tonio may be a foreigner, sir, but he's a very gentle creature, not like those nasty murdering Italians one reads about. He stopped. Poirot looked steadily at him. Is that all you have to say? That is all, sir. He paused, then, as Poirot did not speak, he made an apologetic little bow, and after a momentary hesitation left the dining car in the same quiet, unobtrusive fashion as he had come. This, said Dr. Constantine, is more wildly improbable than any Roman policy I have ever read. I agree, said M. Book. Of the twelve passengers in that coach— Nine have been proved to have had a connection with the Armstrong case. What next, I ask you? Or, should I say, who next? I can almost give you the answer to your question, said Poirot. Here comes our American sleuth, M. Hardman. Is he, too, coming to confess? Before Poirot could reply, the American had reached their table. He cocked an alert at them and, sitting down, he drawled out. Just exactly what's up on this train— it seems bughouse to me. Poirot twinkled at him. Are you quite sure, Mr. Hardman, that you yourself were not the gardener at the Armstrong home? They didn't have a garden, replied Mr. Hardman literally. Or the butler? Haven't got the fancy manner for a place like that. No, I never had any connection with the Armstrong house, but I'm beginning to believe I'm about the only one on this train who hadn't. Can you beat it? That's what I say? Can you beat it? It is certainly a little surprising, said Poirot mildly. Say Rigolo, burst from M. Book. Have you any ideas of your own about the crime, M. Hardman? inquired Poirot. No, sir. It's got me beat. I don't know how to figure it out. They can't all be in it, but which one is the guilty party is beyond me. How did you get wise to all this? That's what I want to know. I just guessed. Then, believe me, you're a pretty slick guesser. Yes, I'll tell the world you're a slick guesser. Mr. Hardman leaned back and looked at Poirot admiringly. You'll excuse me, 
he said, but no one would believe it to look at you. I take off my hat to you. I do, indeed. You are too kind, M. Hartman. Not at all. I've got to hand it to you. All the same, said Poirot, the problem is not yet quite solved. Can we say with authority that we know who killed M. Ratchet? Count me out, said Mr. Hartman. I'm not saying anything at all. I'm just full of natural admiration. What about the other two you've not had a guess at yet? The old American dame and the lady's maid? I suppose we can take it that they're the only innocent parties on the train? Unless, said Poirot, smiling, we can fit them into our little collection as, shall we say, housekeeper and cook in the Armstrong household. Well, nothing in the world would surprise me now, said Mr. Hardman with quiet resignation. Bug house. That's what this business is, bug house. Ah, uh, mon cher, that would be indeed stretching coincidence a little too far, said M. Book. They cannot all be in it. Poirot looked at him. You do not understand, he said. You do not understand at all. Tell me, he said. Do you know who killed Ratchet? Do you? Countered M. Book. Poirot nodded. Oh, yes, he said. I have known for some time. It is so clear that I wonder you have not seen it also. He looked at Hardman and asked. And you? The detective shook his head. He stared at Poirot curiously. I don't know, he said. I don't know at all. Which of them was it? Poirot was silent a minute. Then he said, If you will be so good, M. Hardman, assemble everyone here. There are two possible solutions of this case. I want to lay them both before you all. 9. Poirot propounds two solutions. The passengers came crowding into the restaurant car and took their seats round the tables. They all bore more or less the same expression, one of expectancy mingled with apprehension. The Swedish lady was still weeping and Mrs. Hubbard was comforting her. Now you must just take a hold on yourself, my dear. Everything's going to be perfectly all right. You mustn't lose your grip on yourself. If one of us is a nasty murderer, we know quite well it isn't you. Why? Anyone would be crazy even to think of such a thing. You sit here and I'll stay right by you, and don't you worry any. Her voice died away as Poirot stood up. The wagon-lit conductor was hovering in the doorway. You permit that I stay, monsieur? Certainly, Michel. Poirot cleared his throat. Messrs. E.T. Mesdames, I will speak in English, since I think all of you know a little of that language. We are here to investigate the death of Samuel Edward Ratchet alias Cassetti. There are two possible solutions of the crime. I shall put them both before you, and I shall ask M. Book and Dr. Constantine here to judge which solution is the right one. Now you all know the facts of the case. Mr. Ratchet was found stabbed this morning. He was last known to be alive at 12.37 last night, when he spoke to the wagon-lit conductor through the door. A watch in his pajama pocket was found to be badly dented, and it had stopped at a quarter past one. Dr. Constantine, who examined the body when found, puts the time of death as having occurred between midnight and two in the morning. At half an hour after midnight, as you all know, the train ran into a snowdrift. After that time it was impossible for anyone to leave the train. The evidence of Mr. Hardman, who is a mem, or of a New York detective agency, several heads turned to look at Mr. Hardman, shows that no one could have passed his compartment, number 16 at the extreme end, without being seen by him. We are therefore forced to the conclusion that the murderer is to be found among the occupants of one particular coach, the Stambul Calais coach. That, I will say, was our theory. Comment? Ejaculated M. Book startled. But I will put before you an alternative theory. It is very simple. Mr. Ratchet had a certain enemy whom he feared. He gave Mr. Hardman a description of this enemy, and told him that the attempt, if made at all, would most probably be made on the second night out from Stumble. Now I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Ratchet knew a good deal more than he told. The enemy, as Mr. Ratchet expected, joined the train at Belgrade, or possibly at Vincusi, by the door left open by Colonel Arbuthnot and Mr. McQueen who had just descended to the platform. 
he was provided with a suit of wagon-lit uniform, which he wore over his ordinary clothes, and a pass key which enabled him to gain access to Mr. Ratchet's compartment in spite of the door being locked. Mr. Ratchet was under the influence of a sleeping draft. This man stabbed him with great ferocity and left the compartment through the communicating door leading to Mrs. Hubbard's compartment. That's so, said Mrs. Hubbard, nodding her head. He thrust the dagger he had used into Mrs. Hubbard's sponge bag in passing. Without knowing it, he lost the button of his uniform. Then he slipped out of the compartment and along the corridor. He hastily thrust the uniform into a suitcase in an empty compartment, and a few minutes later, dressed in ordinary clothes, he left the train just before it started off. Again using the same means of egress, the door near the dining car. Everybody gasped. What about that watch? demanded Mr. Hardman. There you have the explanation of the whole thing. Mr. Ratchet had omitted to put his watch back an hour as he should have done at Cerebrad. His watch still registered Eastern European time, which is one hour ahead of Central European time. It was a quarter past twelve when Mr. Ratchet was stabbed, not a quarter past one. But it is absurd, that explanation. Cried M. Book. What of the voice that spoke from the compartment at twenty-three minutes to one? It was either the voice of Ratchet, or else of his murderer. Not necessarily. It might have been, well, a third person. One who had gone in to speak to Ratchet and found him dead. He rang the bell to summon the conductor then, as you express it, the wind rose in him. He was afraid of being accused of the crime and he spoke pretending to be Ratchet. Say possible. Admitted M. Book grudgingly. Poirot looked at Mrs. Hubbard. Yes, madam, you were going to say? Well, I don't quite know what I was going to say. Do you think I forgot to put my watch back to? No, madam. I think you heard the man pass through, but unconsciously. Later you had a nightmare of a man being in your compartment, and woke up with a start, and rang for the conductor. Well, I suppose that's possible. Admitted Mrs. Hubbard. Princess Dragomirov was looking at Poirot with a very direct glance. How do you explain the evidence of my maid, monsieur? Very simply, madam. Your maid recognized the handkerchief I showed her as yours. She somewhat clumsily tried to shield you. She did encounter the man, but earlier, while the train was at Vinkovsi Station. She pretended to have seen him at a later hour with a confused idea of giving you a watertight alibi. The princess bowed her head. You have thought of everything, monsieur. I, I admire you. There was a silence. Then everyone jumped as Dr. Constantine suddenly hit the table a blow with his fist. But no, he said. No, no, and again no. That is an explanation that will not hold water. It is deficient in a dozen minor points. The crime was not committed so, M. Poirot must know that perfectly well. Poirot turned a curious glance on him. I see, he said, that I shall have to give my second solution. But do not abandon this one too abruptly. You may agree with it later. He turned back again to face the others. There is another possible solution of the crime. This is how I arrived at it. When I had heard all the evidence, I leaned back and shut my eyes and began to think. Certain points presented themselves to me as worthy of attention. I enumerated these points to my two colleagues. Some I have already elucidated, such as a grease spot on a passport, etc. I will run over the points that remain. The first and most important is a remark made to me by M. Book in the restaurant car at lunch on the first day after leaving Stambul, to the effect that the company assembled was interesting because it was so varied, representing as it did all classes and nationalities. I agreed with him, but when this particular point came into my mind, I tried to imagine whether such an assembly were ever likely to be collected under any other conditions. And the answer I made to myself was, only in America. In America there might be a household composed of just such varied nationalities, an Italian chauffeur, an English governess, a Swedish nurse, a French lady's maid, and so on. That led me to my scheme of guessing, that is, casting each person for a certain part in the Armstrong drama much as a producer casts a play. Well, that gave me an extremely interesting and satisfactory result. 
I had also examined in my own mind each separate person's evidence with some curious results. Take first the evidence of Mr. McQueen. My first interview with him was entirely satisfactory. But in my second he made rather a curious remark. I had described to him the finding of a note mentioning the Armstrong case. He said, but surely, and then paused and went on, I mean, that was rather careless of the old man. Now I could feel that that was not what he had started out to say. Supposing what he had meant to say was, but surely that was burnt. In which case, McQueen knew of the note and of its destruction. In other words, he was either the murderer or an accomplice of the murderer. Very good. Then the valet. He said his master was in the habit of taking a sleeping draft when traveling by train. That might be true, but would Ratchet have taken one last night? The automatic under his pillow gave the lie to that statement. Ratchet intended to be on the alert last night. Whatever narcotic was administered to him must have been done so without his knowledge. By whom? Obviously by McQueen or the valet. Now we come to the evidence of Mr. Hartman. I believed all that he told me about his own identity, but when it came to the actual methods he had employed to guard Mr. Ratchet, his story was either more nor less than absurd. The only way effectively to have protected Ratchet was to have passed the night actually in his compartment, or in some spot where he could watch the door. The only thing that his evidence did show plainly was that no one in any other part of the train could possibly have murdered Ratchet. It drew a clear circle round the Stambul Calais carriage. That seemed to me a rather curious and inexplicable fact, and I put it aside to think over. You probably have all heard by now of the few words I overheard between Miss Debenham and Colonel Arbuthnot. The interesting thing to my mind was the fact that Colonel Arbuthnot called her Mary and was clearly on terms of intimacy with her. But the Colonel was only supposed to have met her a few days previously, and I know Englishmen of the Colonel's type. Even if he had fallen in love with the young lady at first sight, he would have advanced slowly and with decorum, not rushing things. Therefore I concluded that Colonel Arbuthnot and Miss Debenham were in reality well acquainted, and were for some reason pretending to be strangers. Another small point was Miss Debenham's easy familiarity with the term long distance for a telephone call. Yet Miss Debenham had told me that she had never been in the States. To pass to another witness— Mrs. Hubbard had told us that lying in bed she was unable to see whether the communicating door was bolted or not, and so asked Miss Olson to see for her. Now, though her statement would have been perfectly true if she had been occupying compartments numbers 2, 4, 12, or any even number, where the bolt is directly under the handle of the door, in the uneven numbers, such as compartment number 3, the bolt is well above the handle and could not therefore be masked by the sponge bag in the least. I was forced to the conclusion that Mrs. Hubbard was inventing an incident that had never occurred. And here let me say just a word or two about times. To my mind, the really interesting point about the dented watch was the place where it was found, in Ratchet's pajama pocket, a singularly uncomfortable and unlikely place to keep one's watch, especially as there is a watch hook provided just by the head of the bed. I felt sure, therefore, that the watch had been deliberately placed in the pocket and faked. The crime, then, was not committed at a quarter past one. Was it, then, committed earlier? To be exact, at twenty-three minutes to one? My friend M. Book advanced as an argument in favor of it the loud cry which awoke me from sleep. But if Ratchet were heavily drugged he could not have cried out. If he had been capable of crying out he would have been capable of making some kind of a struggle to defend himself, and there were no signs of any such struggle. I remembered that McQueen had called attention, not once but twice, and the second time in a very blatant manner, to the fact that Ratchet could speak no French. I came to the conclusion that the whole business at twenty-three minutes to one was a comedy played for my benefit. Anyone might see through the watch business, it is a common enough device in detective stories. They assumed that I should see through it, and that, pluming myself on my own cleverness, I would go on to assume that since Ratchet spoke no French the voice I heard at twenty-three minutes to one could not be his, and that Ratchet must be already dead. But I am convinced that at twenty-three minutes to one Ratchet was still lying in his drugged sleep. But the device has succeeded. I have opened my door and looked out. 
I have actually heard the French phrase used. If I am so unbelievably dense as not to realize the significance of that phrase, it must be brought to my attention. If necessary, McQueen can come right out in the open. He can say, excuse me, M. Poro, that can't have been Mr. Ratchet speaking. He can't speak French. Now when was the real time of the crime? And who killed him? In my opinion, and this is only an opinion, Ratchet was killed at some time very close upon two o'clock, the latest hour the doctor gives us as possible. As to who killed him. He paused, looking at his audience. He could not complain of any lack of attention. Every eye was fixed upon him. In the stillness you could have heard a pin drop. He went on slowly. I was particularly struck by the extraordinary difficulty of proving a case against any one person on the train, and on the rather curious coincidence that in each case the testimony giving an alibi came from what I might describe as an unlikely person. Thus Mr. McQueen and Colonel Arbuthnet provided alibis for each other, two persons between whom it seemed most unlikely there should be any prior acquaintanceship. The same thing happened with the English valet and the Italian, with the Swedish lady and the English girl. I said to myself, this is extraordinary, they cannot all be in it. And then, Messrs, I saw light. They were all in it. For so many people connected with the Armstrong case to be traveling by the same train by coincidence was not only unlikely, it was impossible. It must be not chance, but design. I remembered a remark of Colonel Arbuthnet's about trial by jury. A jury is composed of twelve people. There were twelve passengers. Ratchet was stabbed twelve times. And the thing that had worried me all along, the extraordinary crowd traveling in the Stambul, Calais coach at a slack time of year was explained. Ratchet had escaped justice in America. There was no question as to his guilt. I visualized a self-appointed jury of twelve people who condemned him to death and were forced by exigencies of the case to be their own executioners. And immediately, on that assumption, the whole case fell into beautiful shining order. I saw it as a perfect mosaic, each person playing his or her allotted part. It was so arranged that if suspicion should fall on any one person, the evidence of one or more of the others would clear the accused person and confuse the issue. Hardman's evidence was necessary in case some outsider should be suspected of the crime and be unable to prove an alibi. The passengers in the Stambul carriage were in no danger. Every minute detail of their evidence was worked out beforehand. The whole thing was a very cleverly planned jigsaw puzzle, so arranged that every fresh piece of knowledge that came to light made the solution of the whole more difficult. As my friend M. Book remarked, the case seemed fantastically impossible. That was exactly the impression intended to be conveyed. Did this solution explain everything? Yes, it did. The nature of the wounds, each inflicted by a different person. The artificial threatening letters, artificial since they were unreal, written only to be produced as evidence. Doubtless there were real letters, warning Ratchet of his fate, which McQueen destroyed, substituting for them these others. Then Hardman's story of being called in by Ratchet, a lie of course, from beginning to end, the description of the mythical small dark man with a womanish voice, a convenient description, since it had the merit of not incriminating any of the actual wagon-lit conductors and would apply equally well to a man or a woman. The idea of stabbing is at first sight a curious one, but on reflection nothing would fit the circumstances so well. A dagger was a weapon that could be used by everyone, strong or weak, and it made no noise. I fancy, though I may be wrong, that each person in turn entered Ratchet's darkened compartment through that of Mrs. Hubbard and struck. They themselves would never know which blow actually killed him. The final letter which Ratchet had probably found on his pillow was carefully burnt. With no clue pointing to the Armstrong case, there would be absolutely no reason for suspecting any of the passengers on the train. It would be put down as an outside job, and the small dark man with the womanish voice would actually have been seen by one or more of the passengers leaving the train at Broad. I do not know exactly what happened when the conspirators discovered that that part of their plan was impossible owing to the accident to the train. There was, I imagine, a hasty consultation, and then they decided to go through with it. It was true that now one and all of the passengers were bound to come under suspicion, 
but that possibility had already been foreseen and provided for. The only additional thing to be done was to confuse the issue even further. Two so-called clues were dropped in the dead man's compartment, one incriminating Colonel Arbuthnot, who had the strongest alibi and whose connection with the Armstrong family was probably the hardest to prove, and the second clue, the handkerchief, incriminating Princess Dragomirov, who by virtue of her social position, her particularly frail physique and the alibi given her by her maid and the conductor, was practically in an unassailable position. Further to confuse the issue, a red herring was drawn across the trail, the mythical woman in the red kimono. Again I am to bear witness to this woman's existence. There is a heavy bang at my door. I get up and look out, and see the scarlet kimono disappearing in the distance. A judicious selection of people, the conductor, Miss Debenham and McQueen, will also have seen her. It was, I think, someone with a sense of humor who thoughtfully placed the scarlet kimono on the top of my suitcase whilst I was interviewing people in the dining car. Where the garment came from in the first place I do not know. I suspect it is the property of Countess Andrenii, since her luggage contained only a chiffon negligee so elaborate as to be more a tea gown than a dressing gown. When McQueen first learned that the letter which had been so carefully burned had in part escaped destruction, and that the word Armstrong was exactly the word remaining, he must at once have communicated his news to the others. It was at this minute that the position of Countess Andrenii became acute, and her husband immediately took steps to alter the passport. It was their second piece of bad luck. They one and all agreed to deny utterly any connection with the Armstrong family. They knew I had no immediate means of finding out the truth, and they did not believe that I should go into the matter unless my suspicions were aroused against one particular person. Now there was one further point to consider. Allowing that my theory of the crime was the correct one, and I believe that it must be the correct one, then obviously the wagon-lit conductor himself must be privy to the plot. But if so, that gave us thirteen persons, not twelve. Instead of the usual formula, of so many people one is guilty, I was faced with the problem that of thirteen persons one, and one only was innocent. Which was that person? I came to a very odd conclusion. I came to the conclusion that the person who had taken no part in the crime was the person who would be considered the most likely to do so. I referred to Countess Andrenii. I was impressed by the earnestness of her husband when he swore to me solemnly on his honor that his wife never left her compartment that night. I decided that Count Andrenii took, so to speak, his wife's place. If so, then Pierre Michel was definitely one of the twelve. But how could one explain his complicity? He was a decent man who had been many years in the employ of the company, not the kind of man who could be bribed to assist in a crime. Then Pierre Michel must be involved in the Armstrong case. But that seemed very improbable. Then I remembered that the dead nursery maid was French. Supposing that that unfortunate girl had been Pierre Michel's daughter. That would explain everything. It would also explain the place chosen for the staging of the crime. Were there any others whose part in the drama was not clear? Colonel Arbuthnot I put down as a friend of the Armstrongs. They had probably been through T.H., you wore together. The maid, Hildegard Schmidt, I could guess her place in the Armstrong household. I am, perhaps, over -ready, but I sense a good cook instinctively. I laid a trap for her, she fell into it. I said I knew she was a good cook. She answered, yes, indeed, all my ladies have said so. But if you are employed as a lady's maid, your employers seldom have a chance of learning whether or not you are a good cook. Then there was Hardman, he seemed quite definitely not to belong to the Armstrong household. I could only imagine that he had been in love with the French girl. I spoke to him of the charm of foreign women, and again I obtained the reaction I was looking for. Sudden tears came into his eyes, which he pretended were dazzled by the snow. There remains Mrs. Hubbard. Now Mrs. Hubbard, let me say, played the most important part in the drama. By occupying the compartment communicating with that of Ratchet, she was more open to suspicion than anyone else. In the nature of things she could not have an alibi to fall back upon. To play the part she played, the perfectly natural, slightly ridiculous American fond mother, an artist was needed. But there was an artist connected with the Armstrong family, Mrs. Armstrong's mother, 
Linda Arden, the actress. He stopped. Then, in a soft, rich, dreamy voice, quite unlike the one she had used all the journey, Mrs. Hubbard said, I always fancied myself in comedy parts. She went on still dreamily. That slip about the sponge bag was silly. It shows you should always rehearse properly. We tried it on the way out. I was in an even number compartment then, I suppose. I never thought of the bolts being in different places. She shifted her position a little and looked straight at Poirot. You know all about it, M. Poirot. You're a very wonderful man. But even you can't quite imagine what it was like, that awful day in New York. I was just crazy with grief, so were the servants, and Colonel Arbuthnot was there, too. He was John Armstrong's best friend. He saved my life in the war, said Arbuthnot. We decided then and there, perhaps we were mad, I don't know, that the sentence of death that Cassetti had escaped had got to be carried out. There were twelve of us, or rather eleven, Suzanne's father was over in France, of course. First we thought we'd draw lots as to who should do it, but in the end we decided on this way. It was the chauffeur, Antonio, who suggested it. Mary worked out all the details later with Hector McQueen. He'd always adored Sonia, my daughter, and it was he who explained to us exactly how Cassetti's money had managed to get him off. It took a long time to perfect our plan. We had first to track Ratchet down. Hardman managed that in the end. Then we had to try to get Masterman and Hector into his employment, or at any rate one of them. Well, we managed that. Then we had a consultation with Suzanne's father. Colonel Arbuthnot was very keen on having twelve of us. He seemed to think it made it more in order. He didn't like the stabbing idea much, but he agreed that it did solve most of our difficulties. Well, Suzanne's father was willing. Suzanne was his only child. We knew from Hector that Ratchet would be coming back from the East sooner or later by the Orient Express. With Pierre Michel actually working on that train, the chance was too good to be missed. Besides, it would be a good way of not incriminating any outsiders. My daughter's husband had to know, of course, and he insisted on coming on the train with her. Hector wangled it so that Ratchet selected the right day for traveling when Michel would be on duty. We meant to engage every carriage in the Stambul Calais coach, but unfortunately there was one carriage we couldn't get. It was reserved long beforehand for a director of the company. Mr. Harris, of course, was a myth. But it would have been awkward to have any stranger in Hector's compartment. And then, at the last minute you came. She stopped. Well, she said. You know everything now, M. Poro. What are you going to do about it? If it must all come out, can't you lay the blame upon me and me only? I would have stabbed that man twelve times willingly. It wasn't only that he was responsible for my daughter's death and her child's, and that of the other child who might have been alive and happy now. It was more than that. There had been other children before Daisy. There might be others in the future. Society had condemned him. We were only carrying out the sentence. But it's unnecessary to bring all these others into it. All these good faithful souls, and poor Michel, and Mary and Colonel Arbuthnot, they love each other. Her voice was wonderful echoing through the crowded space, that deep, emotional, heart-stirring voice that had thrilled many a New York audience. Poirot looked at his friend. You are a director of the company, M. Book, he said. What do you say? M. Book cleared his throat. In my opinion, M. Poirot, he said. The first theory you put forward was the correct one, decidedly so. I suggest that that is the solution we offer to the Yugoslavian police when they arrive. You agree, doctor? Certainly I agree, said Dr. Constantine. As regards the medical evidence, I think, er, that I made one or two fantastic suggestions. Then, said Poirot, having placed my solution before you, I have the honor to retire from the case. The End don't forget to like the video and subscribe. See you in another video.